When it comes to the age of the earth, the Bible, of course, is very clear. God himself wrote in tablets of stone in Exodus 20, 11, four and six days the Lord made the heavens, the earth, the sea, and all that is in them. On the seventh day he rested. And so the Bible clearly teaches a six literal day creation about 6,000 years ago. The evolutionists object immediately and say, no, that's not physically possible. It's unscientific because we can see stars and galaxies that are billions of light years away. And light, even at the incredible speed of about 186,000 miles per second, would take billions of years to traverse those huge distances. Therefore, the fact that we can see the light shows it must have been traveling for that long. And if it traveled that long, the universe is billions of years old, not thousands of years old. And the Earth must have been here for billions of years. Now, the problem with that argument is that it's caged in seemingly a scientific argumentation, but it really isn't. It's a philosophical argumentation because science is limited and it cannot test the past. It cannot prove what happened in the past. Science cannot prove that there is no God. You'd have to have universal knowledge, omniscience, to prove there is no God. Thus, you would have the attributes of God. Thus, you would be God. Thus, if you could prove there was no God, you'd be God. God would therefore exist. It would be a self-refuting logical argument, as we looked at last night. So they can't prove God doesn't exist. It could be. And science can't pass judgment on whether this is true or not because it's limited. It can't test everything and it can't test the past. Because of this, it could be that there is a God and he is the God of the Bible. And if so, the stars don't exist by chance. They were put there on purpose. And God had a sovereign purpose in them being there for days and seasons, times and years. And God had a purpose in them being there to declare his glory, Psalm 19.1. If we couldn't see them, they wouldn't declare his glory. So if God had a sovereign purpose in creating the universe for us to see the stars, could he do it? Yes, if he exists. For one thing, he doesn't have to follow the laws of chemistry and physics. He made them, they didn't make him. They stand at attention and say, yes, sir, whenever he tells them what to do. Like when he wants to walk on water, or he wants to multiply the loaves and fishes, or he wants to raise the dead. You'll find that violates physical laws. First law of thermodynamics, second law of thermodynamics, law of gravity. But when you own the universe, you can do what you want with it. And if there is a God, he could create the universe in such a way that even with the young Earth, we could see the stars billions of light years away. One thing being, speed of light could have been faster in the past. All we can test is what the speed is today. I asked the evolutionists, what uh, was the speed of light during the week of creation? Well, we don't believe in that, but if it was possibly so, what was the speed? Well, we don't know, we can't test it. Oh, oh, you don't know. Because science is limited in what it can test. All we know is how it functions now. But God has revealed that he did things very fast at the beginning, and then he did them slower afterwards. He created the plants already mature, ready to be fruitful and multiply. Uh, the animals, Adam and Eve, commanded them to be fruitful and multiply. They were mature adults. They were just a few minutes old. You know, uh, When God created them, they looked fully mature, but God did it fast. Thereafter, he says, now be fruitful and multiply. That means conception and gestation and birth and growth and development to adulthood. It takes years to do now what God did fast in the past. So if God wanted to, he could do anything he wants. And we see this in the miracles that he did when he came. He didn't go, send the disciples, go down and get me a uh, permit from City Hall. I want to violate you know, the laws of chemistry and physics now. He just said, hey, I own the universe, and it will do what I tell it to do, unlike sinful, rebellious man who often doesn't. But the universe stands at attention whenever I tell it to, and light will do whatever I tell it to. I'm its creator and its master. We see this also in the case of the miracle on the Sea of Galilee, John chapter 6. For his sovereign purpose, Jesus didn't have the disciples row all the way to the nearest shore. They were stuck in the middle of the sea. To go in any direction to get to the nearest shore would be about three miles or more. And yet it says when he stepped in the boat after calming the wind and the waves, what happened? Immediately they were at the shore. Somebody explain that to me with normal laws of physics and velocity and inertia, how that works. It doesn't. But when you have the creator of the universe in the boat with you, all things are possible. So we have a creator, and with him all things are possible to do with this universe. He spans it with his right hand. It's nothing compared to him and his omnipotent power. So God could have done that, and science can't pass judgment on that because it can't go in back in the past and see what God did or did not do. But he was there, and they weren't, and he gives us his eyewitness account of what happened. He says he did it in six days. Now, another interesting possibility, because as the old proverb says, there's usually more than one way to uh, skin the cat or do the job, uh, and that is the interrelationship between gravity and time, that time can actually run in different speeds in the universe based on such influences as velocity and gravity. And this is uh, detailed in the book and video and DVD by Dr. D. Russell Humphreys, award-winning physicist from Sandia National Laboratories, now currently full-time with the Institute for Creation Research. And he points out that God, of course, created gravity and time and therefore knew about the interrelationship between them long before Darwin, or excuse me, not Darwin, but Einstein, actually figured it out. And therefore, he knew that he had another way that he could solve the engineering problem 
of allowing us to see the stars that declare his glory and yet do it in the young universe because he wanted to do it in six literal days and uh, apparently according to his revelation of chronology in just thousands of years. So one way he could do that, we see, is that if the universe is not as the evolutionists believe, if it has an edge to it, if it's finite and it has an edge to it, and it were stretched out, then the implications that fall right out of Einstein's equation is that there would have been a tremendous gravitational dilation of time at the beginning of the universe. Now in Isaiah 40:22, it says that he who sits upon the circle of the earth and its inhabitants are like grasshoppers who stretches out the heavens like a curtain and spreads them out like a tent to dwell in. Now, if you stretch out space, guess what? You get red-shifted starlight and background radiation, the two supposed major confirmations of the Big Bang. But the Big Bang says nothing popped into something that then, you know, radically inflated, and we get red-shifted starlight and background radiation. God says he did it. He gets the credit. How many times does he say it? 17 times in the Old Testament. Anything God says 17 times, you better stand up and listen. He means to make a point. He gets the glory. Also, God has revealed something that this universe apparently is not infinite. Nobody can count an infinite number, but it says God counts the number of the stars. It gives names to all of them. Certain things God cannot do because of his nature. He cannot lie because he's truth. He cannot be tempted with evil because he's perfect holiness. And he can never see a superior because there's none greater than him. And even he cannot count an infinite number. If there's a limited number of stars, that means the universe and space is, is limited. You go a certain distance, you know, there's no more stars. Now, we can't see the end of it with our Hubble telescope, but, you know, it appears to be infinite to us, and it suits the purpose of declaring the infinite majesty and glory and power of God that way. But his revelation is, it's finite. He spans the heavens with his right hand, so to him it's nothing. But if it is finite, that means that it would have an edge to it. And if he stretched it out, then it was compact at the beginning. With all that gravity, with an edge to it, the universe would have tremendous gravity pulling toward the center. At the center, there would be a tremendous dilation of time, a time warp or gravity well, causing a tremendous difference in the speed of time there as opposed to the rest of the universe. Now, thanks to Einstein, uh, his theory, we know that uh, gravity affects space-time. <coughs> the fabric of space can be stretched, can be warped, and it can affect how fast clocks run in different parts of the universe. Now, we weren't able to really prove this uh, until we got accurate enough clocks, like atomic clocks, can measure in microseconds or millionths of a second. And we run many experiments. We put one at sea level, we put one way up on a mountaintop, and change them back and forth. And they always run differently because of the different effect of gravity. The further you get out of the center of the Earth, of the Earth's gravity well, the faster time will run. And science, of course, whenever you run the same experiment, get the same results all the time, and it appears to be scientific. Now, this is Dr. Russell Humphreys here. And he points out that we now have some very powerful confirming physical evidence in the universe that strongly indicates that our galaxy appears to be at or near the center of our universe, the very place where, before God stretched out the universe, there would be an enormous dilation of time by the effect of gravity. And that's based on the <coughs> observed effect. By the way, no, hope our brother there doesn't have any germs. Anyway, I have an immune system. He told us that, didn't he? Hmm. So... You do get sick, though, sometimes before it takes full effect. Yeah. Anyway, <laughs> anyway, the quantized redshift seemed to indicate the galaxies fall in distinct quanta or groupings, kind of like rungs on a ladder, almost equidistant going out. Now, this is two-dimensional here, like concentric uh, circles. Three-dimensionally, it, it's uh, like concentric shells going further and further out. And guess what galaxy appears to be at or very near the center of this? The Milky Way, our home galaxy. Now, even... Uh, if we take our galaxy, and get back here where I can get that. Sometimes this goes too far. If we just take our galaxy two million light years off center in any direction three-dimensionally, it changes the angle not that much, but enough to make a difference where we would not physically be capable of observing the quantized effect in any direction we look three-dimensionally. It only works physically and optically if we're at or very near the center. Now, two million light years sounds like a lot, but the universe is so big that's nothing compared to the scale of the known observed universe. So on this computer simulation, we see what we actually observe. Because of our un unique position, we do physically observe this distinct peaking or quantization of the redshifts of the galaxies. And if it was just 2 million light years off center, we get this more blurring effect without the distinct peaking and quantization. Even the evolutionists are finally owning up to this. Of course, they knew about it for a long time, but they you know, didn't know what to make of it, didn't like it, doesn't fit well with their Big Bang. Finally, in Nature magazine, <coughs> recently they said, well, we've got to do something with this. Maybe shock waves produce this you know, circular concentric uh, shells of galaxies, this quantized effect, at least they're acknowledging that it's real. Now, it's very distasteful, of course, because it seems to indicate we have a privileged 
area in this galaxy. Carl Sagan said, oh, we're nothing. We're in an average planet around a humdrum star and a lackluster galaxy and billions of other galaxies. And there's nothing special about us. Well, this says there's something very special. The odds of this happening by chance much less than a trillion to one. Why should we be at the center of the universe? Because we're the center of God's concern. We're the apple of his eye. We're made in his image. It's here. Christ shed his blood for us. It's here he will tabernacle with man forever in the new earth. This is the most important place in the universe, according to God's word. Wouldn't it make sense that we should be at the center? Now, that, of course, is exactly where you would have the greatest dilation of time, our galaxy here. Now, as God stretched this out, this effect, actually, the gravity well would, would dissipate and be gone, as today it would be hardly any difference across the universe. But in the past, when it was more compact, the effect would be enormous, especially here at the bottom of this gravity well. And it's there that time would be brought to a virtual standstill relative to how it's running in the outskirts of the universe. In the outskirts of the universe, because of the difference in the effect of gravity on time, you would have the equivalent of billions of years of time. Notice no change in the speed of light, but the speed of time relatively would be so fast that light would appear to be coming in extremely fast, coming into the center, into the Earth. Whereas an Earth's clock, during that same amount of time, because of the difference in the speed of time, Earth's clock would only register six literal days. Now, it's interesting. If you're on Earth, time wouldn't appear to be running slow at all. But if you looked out there, it'd be, like, boy, things, time's running fast out there. If you were out there and looking at Earth, you'd say, boy, time is running slow on Earth. But it wouldn't appear to be if you were out there. It's only when you look through this differentiation of the gravitational time dilation that you would see this, this difference in the speed of time. So Einstein would say, because clocks can run at different rates in the universe, you cannot ask the simple question, how much time has passed? You have to say, based on whose clock, how much time has passed? If Earth's clock is chosen as the standard for the universe, guess what? Exodus 2011 is literally scientifically correct. Even Einstein would say so. If you choose Earth's clock as the standard, then in six days, God created the heavens and the earth to see everything that in them is according to Earth's clock. That's all the time that passed. And <clears throat> indeed, it appears, according to the Bible revelation, that the Earth is the standard because time was first defined in terms of the Earth. The light he called day, the dark night. And there was evening and morning, day one, where? On Earth. The only thing that existed at the time. Sun, moon, and the stars weren't created until day four. So, did God do it this way? I don't know. He certainly could have. He certainly knew about it before Einstein did. Uh, did he use a different speed of light? We don't know. He certainly could have if he exists. Maybe he did it some other way we haven't figured out yet because we're such pea brains compared to God. But the point is, if he exists, he could have done it this way, other ways, we don't know. But his word says he did do it. And we certainly know ways that such a God could do it. And there's certainly no contradiction here. If God exists, that he would be able to do this if he wanted to. Now, some predictions we might get from this. In our local area, our galaxy and nearby areas of space, Magellanic clouds and such, we ought to be able to see that things would appear to be young, not the 10 billion years old that they're purported to be. One of the problems we've known about for over half a century is the winding up dilemma, which is the title the evolutionists give it, and that is the fact that we have a differential rotation speed in spiral arm galaxies, slow rotation on the outskirts, fast rotation in the inner part, Physical forces, differential and rotational speed, should rip these spiral arms apart, make it wind up kind of like a watch spring. And within no more than a few hundred million years, you wouldn't have spiraled arm galaxies. You'd just have a blurred disk. And yet our Milky Way galaxy and other nearby galaxies have these beautiful spiral arms. The Whirlpool galaxy has such delicate spiral arms, no current theory can explain how it could have maintained itself for 10 billion years. But we have a tool in science called <coughs> Occam's razor. Proposed by William of Ockham, he basically said, for any phenomenon, the most uh, simple explanation is most likely the correct one. When you have a big, obtuse theory with all kinds of sub subsidiary hypotheses and, and theories to make it fit, it probably isn't correct. The simplest one is most likely the correct one. The simplest explanation, we would say, is God's word is correct. Our galaxy isn't 10 billion years old, not anywhere near that old. And we don't have to worry about cold, dark matter and all these uh, voodoo science to try to explain it with stuff that we can't see, test, or measure, but what's got to be there to make our pet theory work, we can just say the simplest explanation, it's young. There hasn't been time for the spiral arms to disappear. Now, in our own solar system, <coughs> we have an indication of youth based on the Poynting-Robertson effect, named after a couple of physicists, Poynting and Robertson, amazingly enough, and it is based on the fact that we have an influence of the solar radiation and solar wind affecting micrometeoric material in the solar system, which is believed to be primordial, or there from the origin of the solar system 4.6 billion years ago. Now, on the small particles, it actually pushes on them and accelerates them, eventually uh, 
increasing their velocity to a few tens of thousands of miles per hour and would effectively push them out of the solar system in a much smaller time scale than what they are supposed to have existed. On the larger particles, it exerts a drag effect on their orbital speed, causing them to slow down. They cannot maintain orbit, and so they actually spiral into the sun and get burned up. These two factors are so efficient as calculated, it should have removed all the micrometeoric material up to meteoroids, diameter of two inches, all the way out to the orbit of the planet Jupiter within just two billion years. Now, if the solar system has been here for 4.6 billion years, why is all that micrometeoric material still there, especially the fine material, which is up closer to the sun, which should have been blown away in just thousands of years? That's a strong argument that not only our solar system, but our Milky Way galaxy, other galaxies which we can observe have a lot of dust in them. And this solar wind effect of all the combined stars in the galaxy should have blown it well out of the galaxies in a much shorter time space than their alleged age, according to evolution. But the dust is there, and it's a dusty problem for them. Okay, now, exploding stars point to a young universe. Exploding stars called supernova are interesting in that they produce N SNRs, which are called supernova remnants. <coughs> This is a remnant of radially expanding gas and debris resulting from this explosion. And when we take the average speed of expansion, we can determine based on that speed how long it would take to reach certain expansion diameters. And this thing's always wanting to go further than I want it to go, so we'll bring it back there. For example, in 300 years, at the average rate of expansion, we'd expect a supernova remnant cloud to be about 23 light years in diameter at 120,000 years, 350 light years, and up to 6 million years, 1,500 light years in diameter. Now, with our current instruments, we don't feel we could, we could actually detect them by any means greater than about six million years of expansion. It gets so dilute it just wouldn't be detectable. But we should be able to up to six million years of expansion. So in our parts of our galaxy that we can see, now some of it's obscured with gas and dust, and we can't see everything in our galaxy or it'd be a lot brighter at night, but the parts that we can see, we can estimate how many of these we should have seen and, and how big they ought to be. Well, we ought to see some that are 6 million years old, but based on their expansion diameter, 5 million, 4 million, 3 million, 2 million, 600,000, 400,000, 300,000, uh, a few tens of thousands, right on down to the ones we have seen within historical times and been recorded. We should see this whole spectrum. We don't. Keith Davies, a creationist astronomer, a few years ago, he said he was absolutely fascinated with supernova remnants, began to study it. He looked up all the data published internationally on supernova remnants. He said he was absolutely astounded to find a huge skeleton in the evolutionist closet, something they don't like to talk about much at all and probably wouldn't talk about it all except if we brought it up. And that's the fact that we don't have any large supernova remnants. This is supposed to have been going on at an average of about four per century that we have observed. They claim it's been going on for millions of years. There should be millions of years worth of remnants and there should be a lot of them that are large. Instead, Keith Davies said, in our local vicinity, in our galaxy, in local space, it appears none of them are bigger than about 7,000 years worth of expansion. You gotta ask why, Occam's razor would say. The galaxy nearby area is too young. It can't have gone on for very long. Now another way to look at this also is the number that we should see. If they happen on average of four per century, that's been going on for millions of years, how many would we detect? Well in the portion of our galaxy that we can see, we would uh, estimate about 7,291 in one million years. And if it's only been about 7,000 years, we'd predict about 125 would be visible. What we actually see is only 200. Well, I'll tell you, this is a lot more in the ballpark of thousands of years than it is millions. That's one million. You can multiply that by six for well over 42,000 we ought to be able to see. But they're distinctly absent. And you have to ask, why? Hawkins Razor would say, simplest explanation, the galaxy is too young, just thousands of years old. Also, we have the problem that short period comets have a life expectancy, <coughs> excuse me, of less than 10,000 years. No problem if the solar system is only about between six and 7,000 years old, uh, they'd still be here. They obviously lose mass every time they get close to the sun. They can't last forever. To last 4.6 billion years, their initial mass would have to be larger than the sun itself. Nobody believes that. Uh, therefore, there has to be, they claim, a source of replenishment. And this is uh, the famous or infamous Oort cloud proposed by the Dutch astronomer by the name of Mr. Oort. So there's a big dark cloud way out there and it nests billions of comets, and every now and then a wandering star or something comes through and its gravity kicks comets into the Kuiper belt on the outskirts of our solar system, and from there they come in their highly elliptical orbits around the sun, and it's replenished over billions of years. The Problem is uh, that, as one cosmologist said, we ought not to be allowed to invoke the tooth fairy more than once. <laughs> he said, uh, we invoked it once already when we got the whole universe out of nothing, 
And here we're invoking a cold, dark cloud that we cannot detect by any means at all as the means of saving the bacon of our pet theory and explaining why comets are still here. Uh, but it's gotten even worse, even on a theoretical aspect. If we had these billions of comets out there, recently they've published evidence that these would be bumping into each other and annihilating one another, and uh, this would eliminate their numbers so rapidly that they could not have lasted at all the billions of years required. Furthermore, analysis of the Kuiper Belt shows it only has about 7 or 8% of the cometary material they once thought it had. It doesn't appear to have enough either. So not only don't we see it, even on theoretical grounds, it doesn't appear that it would work. Even Carl Sagan pointed out the irony of this. He said, many scientific papers are written each year about the Oort cloud, its properties, its origin, its evolution, yet there is not yet a shred of direct observational evidence for its existence. They say we're foolish for believing in a god that we can't see. Well, I tell them, you believe in your Oort cloud, and it's not even theoretically possible. Uh, God is at least theoretically possible, and we have plenty of evidence that he is there, that he has not been silenced, he's changing lives today, he has spoken through his prophets, and we see his intelligent design all over this universe. Now, we also have the problem of the recession of the moon. Because of gravitational and tidal interaction between the Earth and the moon, there is a tugging here that slows down the Earth's rotational speed on its axis, and the laws of conservation of angular momentum require that that must be gained by a recession of the moon receding further and further out in its orbit from the Earth. Now, this effect would be multiplied times greater as they get closer together, according to Newton's inverse square law of gravitation. Using that law, we can compute that even if the moon was touching the edge of the Earth to recede to its present position, it would only take about 1.37 billion years, and yet the moon is supposed to be 4.6 billion years old. We have to ask, why hasn't it receded way out here? Furthermore, we have the Rocher limit. Uh, some people call it the Roche limit, but I think Rocher was French, so I think you'll know, give it a French flair and call him Rocher. Uh, that he, about 8,000 miles or so out from the Earth, you have this limit. If you get the moon closer than that, the gravity of the Earth would rip it apart and destroy it. So you'd have to start outside the Rocher limit, and then that would put it even further out here if indeed it was that old. Uh, that's a big problem, and no current theories of lunar origin have all the details worked out. All of them seem to have fatal flaws. Even the big impact one has a problem with Rocher's limit, has a problem with angular momentum. But one of the other theories is, well, maybe the moon originated 4.6 billion years ago elsewhere, but it was only recently captured by the Earth. That's why it hasn't receded too far. But things that wander through space all seem to be going extremely fast. Everything we measure is going very, very fast, too fast to be captured. It would simply slingshot around the Earth's gravity and go back out and never come back. If it did get captured, we would expect a very elongated elliptical orbit, a classic capture orbit with a very pronounced apogee and perigee, but we don't see that. So the simplest explanation, Rocher, uh, well, not Rocher, but uh, uh, the, um, uh, uh, yeah, thank you, <laughs> Occam, good old Occam's razor, uh, would be that the moon is young. He created the lesser night to rule the night, and not that long ago. Now, uh, get this thing back here. Now, the Earth and the moon, as they orbit around the sun, they pick up this micrometeoric material. They measured this in the 50s and 60s. Uh, when they're wanting to put men on the moon, they said, well, on the moon, well, it's not eroded into an ocean or something that ought to be there. It's tightly compacted, about 60 feet deep in billions of years, loosely compacted, about 180 feet deep. Uh, when Neil Armstrong landed on the moon, however, he said he could scrape with his boot through the dust onto solid rock, so it wasn't very deep. Now, you don't have to be a rocket scientist to figure out if there's very little, then there was not much time based on this argument, or that there's a lot, there was a lot of time. So, oh, the moon appears to be young, not very much accumulation of meteoric dust. But the evolutionists didn't like that. They kept looking at that and said, well, you know, every time this has been measured, it's been different, sometimes extremely different by a factor of a 1,000. And that could be, you know, that as the moon is orbiting around uh, uh, the Earth and going around the sun, it encounters belts or waves or fluctuations of this dust, in which case you get a lot of waves during billions of years. You still should have a lot. But to really prove that scientifically, you'd probably have to have decades, if not centuries, of constant monitoring to prove that this is a definite ongoing pattern. We don't have time to do that. So I just say, don't bother with this. You know, this, we have plenty of other evidences of youth. We don't need to, to beat this one if they want to dispute it because of the discrepancies. But there are other problems regarding dust that they don't really have a very good answer for. One of them being the moon, having no atmosphere and no ozone, is subject to the full strength impingement of cosmic and solar radiation, which can break down even hard basalt-type rocks, such as we find in the maria of the moon, or the seas of the moon, at a rate of about four to ten thousandths of an inch per year, which doesn't sound like much. But in about uh, one year, you'd get about 33 feet of radiation erosion. Boulders this size would be reduced to a pile of dust by this erosion in much less than one million years. 
uh, and the course of billion years differs by a factor of a thousand, three orders of magnitude, so instead of 33 feet, it'd be 33,000 feet. That means, uh, you know, you'd expect that mountains with this dust being produced here would slough off by gravitation when it gets shook by asteroid impacts, it would shake, all that dust would shake off and slough off to the base of mountain ranges and craters. We had at least see some of that, if indeed this has been going on for billions of years. Yet they found no significant amount of that radiation erosion dust. One scientist had a sense of humor about this. He said, what are we to make a lack of radiation erosion dust on the moon? Could it be perhaps that the Martian mining company is sneaking secretly to the dark side of the moon? And they're sweeping up all this dust, and they're carting it off to Mars. And maybe we'll find it on Mars when we land there, because we sure don't find it on the moon. Well, I've got a simpler explanation. Occam's razor would say the moon has hardly any evidence of this erosion because it hasn't been there long enough. Also, we find that rocks actually flow under the constant force of gravity. They have a viscosity index, a rate of flow index. And of course, it's much uh, <coughs> slower than water, much slower than molasses in January but it does flow. And when we take that known index for the type of rocks we have on the moon, such as uh, basalt in the maria, and a type of uh, usual type of feldspar in the, the highlands, uh, we find that we ought not to have mountains and big craters on the moon if they're billions of years old. In fact, even if it's just a fraction of the known flow rate, we wouldn't see this. Some of the craters have very sharp edges to them that we should have seen some physical slumping of that ob observationally within just 100,000 years or so and we don't even see that. It would seem to indicate that the moon's craters are just thousands of years old, evidence of a major catastrophe passing through our solar system just thousands of years ago. And of course, the Bible tells us on the same day all the fountains of the great deep were broken open, windows of heaven were open, something broke up the crust of the earth. With the uh, unique geology of the earth, of course, plate tectonics and things like that, and the erosion of the flood, you wouldn't expect to have this evidence left on the earth, but on the moon and the other planets in the solar system, you would expect it. Indeed, we see it. Now, on the Earth, we have a problem, though. If we have meteorites coming in for billions of years, there ought to be a lot of meteorites. We have the famous meteorite crater there in Arizona. They estimate from studies on the Antarctic continent that the continents receive about 18,000 meteorites per year. You multiply that by billions of years, you're getting multiple trillions of fossil meteorites that should be in the sedimentary rock layers if indeed it took millions, even billions of years for this to build up. We have fossils in there, they claim are billions of years old. Where are the fossil meteorites that should have fallen in by the trillions? You know, meteorites are pretty expensive, and it's supply and demand. If there's trillions of them all over, they wouldn't be worth much more than any other rock. But they're rather rare, and they ought not to be if the crust of the Earth is as old as they claim. Now, what about ancient stalactites? Do they really exist? Well, the old formula taught in the university was that it supposedly took 100,000 years to get one cubic inch of flowstone formation. Using that, they calculated Carlsbad was something like 260 million years old because of the size of its huge stalactites and stalagmites and columns. Well, we know that science is based on observation, and even evolutionists have been observing, hey, that old formula is wrong. We have many ex exceptions to it where we see these flowing much faster and forming much faster than that formula allows for. For example, <clears throat> here we have them growing under an old bridge. It takes 100,000 years to get one cubic inch. This bridge might be a few tens of thousands of years old. I don't think it's quite that old. And we have, if I can get it up here. Oops, boy, I really went fast that time. Okay. All right. Pack a little bit more here. There we go. Under, under the Lincoln Memorial, we have stalactites growing. Now, if it took 100,000 years to get one cubic inch, we have maybe two, two and a half cubic inches there. Is it 250,000 years old? When the photograph was taken, the Lincoln Memorial was only 45 years old. Here we have a shawl coming out of the side of a cave. If we didn't know the age of the cave, we used the old formula. We'd say this cave must have been here at least millions of years. Look at all the cubic inches. Yet this was artificially cut during the Australian gold rush, and we know that when the photograph was taken, it was only 140 years old. Here we have an old water wheel in the outback of Australia. Water continued to uh, trickle down the flume and totally froze the water wheel, overflowed the basin. Many cubic inches, got to be millions of years old, but we know when the photograph was taken, it was only 65 years old. Here, if ever a picture was worth a thousand words, we have a picture from a man-made mining tunnel in Australia. If you look in the lower right-hand corner, you can see a couple of miners there, give you a perspective of how big these are compared to the average uh, human. Quite large. And uh, if we use that old formula, well, this cave is millions of years old, but it so happens that we know this cave was artificially cut, and when the photograph was taken, it was only 55 years old. If it continued to grow at this rate for 10 times longer, 550 years, it would rival most anything we have in Carlsbad Caverns. 
And I'm sure, as Michael Lord has pointed out, after the flood with an ice age, we'd have a lot more moisture in the air, a lot more rainfall at these latitudes. And with just centuries of this type of flow going on, thousands of years at the most, you could attain these huge sizes. Now here we have the George Rogers Clark Memorial built on the bank of the Wabash River in Vincennes, Indiana. Does anybody remember who George Rogers Clark was? That poor fellow, nobody remembers him. I wouldn't remember, but it was on the History Channel the other day. He was a Revolutionary War hero. Anyway, his limestone monument there, built during the administration of Franklin Delano Roosevelt, was only 40 years old when they took this photograph. Yet, water trickling through the cracks in the foundation caused stalactites to grow. On the plumbing, four huge support pillars, 11 feet long, in the basement, completely overflown in just 40 years. Even in Carlsbad Caverns, we have evidence that in the past, the rate of flowstone formation was much more rapid than what we have seen in recent times. And here we have a bat that died. It fell down on top of a stalagmite. Now, if it's taken 100,000 years for that thing to grow by just one cubic inch, that bat would rot completely into dust and oblivion and would be gone. Instead, it grew so fast, it actually encased the bat and fossilized it before it could decay. That's a pretty fast rate of growth. So caving into reality, the shrinking age of stalactites and stalagmites, this is a quote from Arizona Highways Magazine where they interviewed a cave geologist and evolutionist by the name of Mr. Trout. And, <clears throat> excuse me, it says, what geologists used to believe was fact in terms of dating the cave, now a speculation, Trout says. From 1924 to 1988, there was a visitor's sign above the entrance to Carlsbad Caverns that said Carlsbad was at least 260 million years old. In 1988, the sign was changed to read 7 to 10 million years old. Then for a little while, the sign read it was just two million years old, and now the sign is gone. <laughs> well, they kept noticing faster and faster growth rates. They had to keep revising their estimate, and pretty soon it got so ridiculous, they said, we're not going to put up a sign at all. The article continues, in short, he, Mr. Trout, says geologists don't know how long cave development takes, and while some believe that cave decorations, such as SP's beautiful icicle-looking stalactites, took years to form, Trout says that through photo monitoring, he has watched a stalactite grow several inches in a matter of days. The record, ten, uh, seven inches in just 10 days. Now, that was during a time of unusually heavy rainfall in uh, New Mexico, which is now a desert area, but after the flood, it would not be a desert. Lots of rain for centuries. And at that rate of growth, just centuries would produce the bulk of Carlsbad Caverns. Now, I can get the right picture up here. The Lost Squadron. This was a squadron of P-38 Lightnings and two B-17 Flying Fortresses trying to ferry from Goose Bay in North America to Greenland, to Iceland, and then to... Uh, Great Britain for the air war in Europe. They did make it to their base here trying to get to Iceland. They told them our base is closed. We have terrible uh, storms. You can't land here. They tried to go back. They ditched on the glacier when they ran out of fuel trying to make it back to the original base. They radioed for help and were picked up by dog sled and they abandoned the aircraft. Too much of a logistical nightmare to salvage them in the middle of World War II. So nearly 50 years later, people had raised money and thought, boy, these planes are worth millions of dollars. We'll salvage them and we'll be millionaires. And, of course, these little layers we have in the ice, as the evolutionists have interpreted them as, you know, annual layers, they said, well, there wouldn't be that many 48 layers in 48 years. wouldn't be enough to cover these big aircraft. But they found the aircraft were covered after all. In fact, with ground-penetrating radar or ground-penetrating uh, sonar, I'm not sure what they used, they triangulated and did locate the lost squadron, but it was only under more than 250 feet of ice in just 48 years with hundreds of these layers. See, we have the Gulf Stream running up near Greenland. That means warm water with evaporation that comes over and precipitates out as tremendous snowfall. You'd have that effect multiplied, magnified during the Ice Age, where you'd have a lot of warm water and a lot of evaporation, and the bulk of these uh, glaciers uh, formed then, especially in Antarctica, where Antarctica is pretty much a desert area today, but back at that time, it would be getting a lot of these layers from these storms. The actual final uh, calibration was 268 feet of ice. They actually pulled out one of these P-38s. It's now in flying condition, flying at air shows. They named it Glacier Girl. Well, if we get hundreds of these layers of ice in just 48 years, then it doesn't take hundreds of thousands of years, as they have interpreted, to get those layers. It could well be done, especially with the Ice Age, within the biblical time framework. Creating opals in months, not millions of years. Well, a scientist in Australia, creationist, said, hey, you know what? They taught me that it takes millions of years must not be true. God knows better. He said he did it in thousands of years. So it must be more a matter of chemistry and the right chemical catalyst making this work. So he kept dabbling in the opal fields until he figured out how to make it work. He knows the secret, and uh, he can now grow genuine gem-quality opals in the glass jar in a matter of months. They're so perfect. They're indistinguishable from natural opals, even under electron microscope. You can detect no difference. There is no difference. They are genuine. But it only takes months. 
just because of the right chemistry. And this shows how uh, he thought outside of the box. He didn't let old earth dogma tell him how to run experiments. This could have been done centuries ago. The chemistry really isn't that difficult, but nobody thought of doing it because within the last two centuries, everybody's been telling us everything's millions of years old, everything takes millions of years. So this shows how old earth dogma stifled the advancement of scientific knowledge and showed us that, hey, you know, nobody ran the experiment because they thought it wasn't worth trying. Well, also, we find that we can get diamonds in hours, not millions of years, a few years ago. I saw on the Learning Channel, one hour documentary, fascinating, the Russians figured out, hey, with heat and pressure on solid blocks of graphite, we can get two carat gem quality diamonds in just a matter of hours. They figured that out after coming out of decades of stifling atheistic communism just by being practical scientists. They said, well, we find diamonds mostly in the necks of old volcanoes where the carbon would, would have been subjected to great heat and pressure. Maybe heat and pressure is more important than time. So they ran the experiment, oh my goodness, it does happen quickly, it does not take millions of years. Also, we can get instant petrified wood, well, not exactly instant, but a whole lot faster than we've been told. It takes mainly uh, the absorption of uh, mineral-rich or, or silica-rich water into the wood that then replaces the cell structure and crystallizes, makes it hard as rock. A scientist in America studied that and said, well, you know, we have many examples of this happening in nature within a few years to a few decades. He said, I wonder if we could speed that up now that we know how it works. And so he has patented a process whereby injection of silica-rich solution under heat and pressure can cause wood to petrify in a matter of days to weeks, fast enough to be a commercial product. If he wants to patent and market that, you could order from him a hardwood floor, and by golly, it would be a hardwood floor. <laughs> it, uh, <laughs> it would be petrified wood, but it wouldn't be millions of years old. It just doesn't take that long. Well, what about fast fossils? According to the Bible, all the fossils form fast. Logically, organics corrupt and break down and decay. If they're not turned to stone or lithified or fossilized rapidly, they don't hang around, they turn to dust. So logically, fossils must have formed rapidly. God's revelation says the bulk of them form rapidly. And we have plenty of examples of fast fossils. The fact that something's fossilized does not prove it took millions of years uh, or that it's millions of years old. One of my favorite fossils is this miner's felt hat on display in a museum in Australia. It's no longer a soft hat, it's a hard hat. It is fossilized. Fell off a miner's hat at the bottom of a uh, mine shaft. It, uh, absorbed, dissolved, cementing chemicals, calcite, silica, pyrite, something like that, and it's now a hard hat. Another fossil hat is found in a museum in New Zealand, where a whole village was inundated with volcanic ash, and uh, the rain leached out the silica, and it, it petrified and fossilized the whole city. Even got such amazing things as petrified ham. Well, that's a fossil ham, but it's not millions of years old. It just doesn't take that long if the chemistry is right, as it would have been definitely many times during the flood. Here we have a fossil clock. It doesn't take millions of years for sediments to harden into sedimentary rock and form fossils, otherwise this modern type clockworks would be millions of years old. And my favorite fast fossil is the limestone cowboy. Not the rhinestone, but the limestone cowboy. Found outside of Irene, Texas, 1980, the custom stitching pattern traced back to the manufacturer confirmed that this boot could not be in existence any earlier than the mid-1950s. It might have been later, but it couldn't have been any earlier than that. And we found it in 1980, so it wasn't in the environment all that long, and yet all the bones are completely fossilized. They're not millions of years old. There is a bit of a gruesome story here, however. This bone here may at first appear to be one of the lower leg bones, but actually it is the femur bone or thigh bone. Apparently this fellow fell from quite an altitude, landed square on his foot, and crushed his thigh bone into his ankle. Ouch. Uh, well, at least his uh, remains have been preserved for posterity to show us it doesn't take billions of years to get fossil bones. I always am reminded when I see this picture of a true story in my own life where I once had to jump out of an aircraft at over 5,000 feet altitude without a parachute, and I survived. People said, how did that happen? Was it a miracle of God? Well, it wasn't so much a miracle as it was an exercise of common horse sense that the good Lord gave us. I happened to have been visiting Denver, Colorado, the Mile High City, and the plane was on the ground when I jumped out of it. <laughs> See, the common sense tells you don't jump out if you're above ground level that high, but I was above sea level. There is a difference. Make sure you know the difference when you jump out of an airplane. Okay, rapid rocks. Granites, they didn't need millions of years of cooling. Well, you know, this is a long argument. Hugh Ross, everybody has tried to use this. You know, the granitic plutons, you know, supposedly have very inefficient uh, diffusion of their heat. It would take millions of years for them to cool down. But when we looked at their calculations, we found they left out big, big uh, problems there. Uh, factors not taken into account, the fact that these things spontaneously crack and huge cracks and fissures form when it crystallizes and cools down on the surface. 
The cracks and fissures would increase the surface area, allow steam to come pouring out, producing evaporative and convective cooling, and allowing rain and snow to get in there and boil out, and you get more evaporative and convective cooling. When you factor that in, in a much more realistic model, we find that even the largest granitic plutons would not take more than about 3,000 years to cool down. One of my favorite indications of the young age of the Earth is the erosion of sediments and chemicals into the ocean. If we have an ocean, which the evolutionists claim has been here for 3 billion years, we would have a water cycle where the sun's energy causes evaporation that comes over the continents, condenses out as rainfall, and flushes chemicals and sediments back into the ocean. This cycle going on for 3 billion years would have some obvious evidence. For one thing, most all the chemicals in the ocean should have reached maximum saturation level a long time ago. None of them are at maximum saturation level, not even close. None of them are close to yielding a 3 billion or 2 billion or 1 billion year age, not even close. Now, some of them do give apparent ages of millions of years, assuming the ocean started out as pure as distilled water and the only way, for example, that salt is getting in. Uh, we take all the ways it can come in, all the ways it comes out, based on all the published data, and even the evolutionists have looked at this, you get roughly three quarters of the salt that goes in stays in. Only about one fourth can come back out. So it does keep building up year after year. And to get its present concentration, it would only take about 32 million years. If we allow the greatest amount to come out conceivably and the smallest amount to go in, you know, you only get about 62 million years. Now, that doesn't mean the ocean would be that old. That means if we assume it started out pure as distilled water. God reveals he created it. He probably put some salinity in there. Massive amounts were put in by a cataclysmic flood, causing massive erosion and deposition of chemicals rapidly. So we can account with creation in the flood for how much there's in there. It's a whole lot harder to account for how this water cycle has been going on for three billion years and the ocean is not a toxic waste dump deader than the Dead Sea, which it should have been based on this information within a few hundred million years, no life could live in it, not even algae. Algae can live almost anywhere, but it can't live in the Dead Sea and it couldn't live in the ocean after just a few hundred million years of these chemicals going in. Now also, the erosion of the continents. The continents average about 383 million billion tons, and yet they're eroding at an average global rate of a little over 27 billion tons. And you do the math, you find out we get an amazing answer, and that is the continents would erode down to sea level in just about 14 million years. Now it'd be a bit slower as you, when it's higher, it erodes faster, when it, lower, it gets lower, it doesn't erode quite as fast, but you know, somewhere between you know, 14 to to 30 or so million years. Now, that's the problem, because we have fossils on the continents, and the, the surface rocks are the fossil-bearing sedimentary rock strata. Some of those fossils, they claim, are hundreds of millions, even billions of years old. Why are they still intact? I mean, the surface rocks would go first. How could it stay there? They say, well, the continents are uplifting. We measure this little bit of uplift. We believe it's maybe just a little residual uplift from when the continents rapidly uplifted at the end of the flood. But even if it was uplifting, you can't save the surface. The surface is going to be wiped out in just tens of millions of years at the most. That means the fossil record is gone in an incredibly brief time scale, but it's there. It seems to indicate the fossil record has formed recently, far too recently, to have uh, been around as long as the evolutionists claim that it has been. And the sediment going in the ocean at present rates, about 400 meters on the average, it's much thicker toward the continents and, and almost barren in the deep ocean, the average is about 400 meters. You get all that at present rates in about 12, 13 million years. Now, we believe the flood put most of it there fast, so it wouldn't take that long. But why is there so little if all this erosion has been going on? If the mountains are uplifting and they're eroding all this time, where's all those chemicals and, and uh, sediments going? The ocean should be chocked with many kilometers thickness of sediments. It should be a toxic waste dump that no life could live in. And there should be no visible fossil record left on the continents because it would have been wiped out in a relatively short amount of time. The evolutionists in desperation have tried to say, well, you know, man has caused a lot of erosion. Man's stirring things up. It's man's fault. The erosion rates are too high because man has interfered. Well, even their own estimates is that he's only increased it maybe two to two and a half times of what it would have been otherwise, and it would have to be hundreds of times greater to effectively erase this argument. So that kind of doesn't work. Furthermore, they didn't take into account what man has done to inhibit erosion. We don't like erosion. We do a lot of things to inhibit it on purpose. Every time we build flood control dams, dikes, levees, it inhibits the amount of sediment that would ordinarily get down to the ocean. Everywhere we pave roads and build buildings, the soil under that doesn't erode because we maintain those buildings and roads and we keep that soil from e eroding. So I would say man has done a lot more to inhibit erosion than he has to cause it, but he certainly hasn't increased it the hundreds of times that would be required to negate this argument. Also, we find that major river systems have underfit deltas. 
Uh, the, the total sediment in the Mississippi River Delta, we can accommodate at present rates of deposition about 30,000 years. There are different views on that as to how long, but it ranges in thousands of years, not millions. And of course, we believe the uplift of the continents, this big offwash, put a lot there, heavy rain during the Ice Age after the flood, caused a lot to deposit fast. So we can explain why it is as big as it is in the young world because of the effect of the flood in the Ice Age. It's a whole lot harder, though, to believe that Old Man River just kept a rolling along for millions of years. But somehow, Old Man River didn't deposit billions of years of sediment in the delta. Finally, we come to carbon-14. Everybody wants to know about that. Carbon-14 has a lot of misunderstanding. It can't date rocks. It only date things that were once living and eating and breathing. Okay, rocks don't do that, so it can't date them. But how does it work? Cosmic rays bombard the atmosphere, producing fast-moving neutrons. The neutrons collide with atmospheric nitrogen atoms, nitrogen-14 atoms. Shearing off a proton, gaining a neutron, we end up with carbon-14 which is radioactive, it tends to decay back into nitrogen-14 with a half-life of about 5,730 years. It's absorbed into plants during photosynthesis. Uh, we eat plants, it goes down the food chain, so things that breathe and eat get carbon-14 in them. Now, <coughs> carbon-14, like ordinary carbon, combines with oxygen to produce carbon dioxide. Vegetation absorbs carbon dioxide during photosynthesis, so it gets into living creatures. Since animals feed on vegetation, it's added to their bodies. The present ratio is about trillion to one. For every trillion normal carbon-12 atoms in the environment, there's only one carbon-14. So it's, it's quite a dilute uh, ratio. <clears throat> However, remember that ratio. That's critical to understanding what's going on here. After death, this ratio will slowly decrease, since while carbon-14 continues to decay, it is not replenished by feeding. The amount of carbon-14 in a dead animal shows how long it has been dead if, and what a big if, one can be sure of the amount of carbon-14 in it when it died. See, if the Bible revelation is true, and I believe it is, then there's good reason to believe that trillion to one ratio was drastically different in the not-too-distant past, because the Earth is young. There hasn't been all this time for it to build up, and because of the flood, we had a tremendous uh, uh, starting over period after the flood, burying most of the carbon in the environment. You have to start over again. So there would be a big, big difference in this ratio just thousands of years ago. They won't hear of that. They don't believe in creation. They don't believe in the flood. They won't take that into account. Now, if we do take that into account, we can recalibrate the equation and make it fit. The closer we get to the flood, uh, we, the more it would be off. The closer we get to the present, the more accurate it would be. However, there are other problems. Uh, living mollusk shells, carbon dated at being 2,300 years old. Freshly killed seal, 1,300 years old. Uh, shells from living snails, 27,000 years old. One part of the Bolasovich mammoth, carbon dated at 29,000. The other part, 44,000. You have to wonder what part of this poor creature was so much older than the rest of him. Uh, and this is just, there's just problems and anomalies we don't have a complete handle on. However, how do the evolutionists deal with this? These honest evolutionists said, if a carbon-14 date supports our theories, we put it in the main text. If it does not entirely contradict them, we put it in a footnote. And if it's completely out of date, we just drop it. Well, how convenient. Uh, other evolutionist uh, expert in this field, Robert Lee, very frustrated with the use of this to try to date the archaeological finds, said the troubles of the radiocarbon dating method are undeniably deep and serious. Despite 35 years of technological refinement and better understanding, the underlying assumptions have been strongly challenged, and warnings are out that radiocarbon may soon find itself in a crisis situation. Continuing use of the method depends on a fix-it-as-we-go approach, allowing for contamination here, fractionation there, and calibration whenever possible. It should be no surprise, then, that fully half of the dates are rejected. The wonder is surely the remaining half come to be accepted. No matter how quote-unquote useful it is, though, the radiocarbon method is still not capable of yielding accurate and reliable results. There are gross discrepancies. The chronology is uneven and relative, and the accepted dates are actually selected dates. Hmm. So when you can selectively publish, you can make anything look good. But the major point I want to make here is that carbon-14 is a tremendous friend of young Earth creationism, because if the atmosphere was just 30,000 years old, it would be at equilibrium. It takes 30,000 years to reach equilibrium. It would start over after the flood. It would be right about here between four and 5,000 years, which is right where we measure it, that far out of equilibrium. Face value, the atmosphere could not have been here for more than thousands of years. Also, every sample of coal, oil, wood, or bone has been tested for carbon-14 content, even if retrieved from supposedly millions of years old rocks, always contains measurable carbon-14. Its half-life is only 5,730 years. In about 10 half-lives, you have virtually no detectable trace. Nobody said you could detect it after 100,000 years, even counting individual carbon-14 atoms. Yet it's there in very measurable amounts. Why? Because it was buried by the flood just thousands of years ago, and there hasn't been enough time for it to decay into oblivion. Finally, one last point. Well, racemization. We know amino acids shift spontaneously after death from exclusively left-handed to left and right-handed. They should be thoroughly racemized in, in the fig tree chert, supposedly 3 billion years old. We don't find it. 
evidence that was laid down by the flood just thousands of years ago. Finally, uh, radioactive decay itself has turned the tables on evolutionists because now we have a major byproduct of that decay, radiogenic helium, which we can now show is trapped in these deep hot rocks where we know from its diffusion rate, from its leakage rate, that it had to have been produced in massive amount about 6,000 years ago, plus or minus 2,000 years, what the data indicates. And the amount that's leaked out is only as much as will leak out in that time. If it was produced over billions of years, it would have leaked out of these rocks, it would be in the atmosphere, and it's not there. Powerful physical evidence all over the crust of the Earth that radioactive decay was rapid in the past. Here again, I don't have time to go into great detail. Population problem, well, if we had Mr. and Mrs. Homo erectus for one million years, we'd have about 10 to the power of 8,600 people on the planet today. That's a lot of people, one with 8,600 zeros. If we had Mr. and Mrs. Noah and his family with just one half of 1% uh, average growth rate, we'd get about six to seven billion in four and a half thousand years, right where it is. We find also that the recorded history is too short. It only goes back several thousands of years. Why doesn't it go back tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands if man's been around with his big brain for a long time? And the oldest living things only go back several thousands of years. Why not tens of thousands of years? Because the flood caused the earth to start over. Well, if the rocks could talk, they would say something. Jesus said, on the day of the triumphal entry, I tell you, if these were silent, the very stones would cry out. And if he could give stones a voice to speak, like he did with Balaam's donkey, what a tale they would say. Hey, we're not millions of years old. We've been eroded in the sea a long time ago. We're full of unracemized amino acids from the flood. We're full of, of fossils that still have intact DNA and protein that disappears in just tens of thousands of years. We have radiogenic helium in us that would have leaked out a long time ago. And we would have the bones of trillions of dead people if man had been here for just one million years. We're young. The word of God is true. Listen to him. Let God be true. And let every man be a liar. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate your patience, but I've run out of time.